if we're thinking of your work as a diary, yes. Um, all, all the animals, for example, the animals that you live with, the donkeys, oh, the yes. dogs, everything, all, all, the, all, the, all the, the, the flowers, all the vases, are all things that you have in, in, in your house. I mean, that's the drawing room at Shank Hill. Um, do, do, you, do you ever sort of wonder what the next step is going to be? in terms of painting. Do you think you might do something quite different? Or what, do you have any ambition that hasn't been fulfilled? Because for you, painting is definitely a form of the truth. Because of your generosity, generosity of spirit, giving, giving, and more giving, it could be you, it could be Ireland, I think it's you. This giving, this generous spirit, this is your way of expressing the truth. And I'm just wondering where you might go next. Whether you might surprise us by having a kind of new way, like so many artists do, when they get to their absolute maturity. I mean, I suppose uh, the best thing is the unknown in a way, it's mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like to think that I'd like to um, improve on what I've done. You know, I want to... Yeah. I have no idea what I would paint next. Yeah. I mean, as I said earlier, the subject matter is really an excuse to put down the paint. Yes, yes, yes. It's a physical... It's physical. It's very physical. And yes. would you think that... Um, Again, coming a bit closer back to Van Gogh, Van Gogh always said that painting was the lightning conductor of his life, that painting discharged all the tension and, well, he had a lot of stress, he had chronic loneliness uh, down in R, and that, that, that the painting was the lightning conductor, simply discharged all that, and, and I'm wondering if it's the same thing for you, because it, for you it is the physical act of painting that is the thing that's important. I think, it's, I think you're quite right. I, I mean, I've seen you painting, and it's a very physical process. It's totally physical, yes. 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 I suppose if I had a choice of medium, I'd like to be a singer. Really? And after that, I'd like to be a dancer. Oh, no. I saw Nuri of Dance with oh, Margaret Fontaine in the um, uh, Opera House in London, mm -hmm. Covent Garden, you. when I was 19. And that was a, a great thrill, you know. But... Um, you can just only do whatever you have so to do. So singing and dancing are also very physical. Yes, very yeah, physical. Yes, it's yeah. very physical. So you wouldn't want to sit down and write a, a novel or a poem or something like that. But well, I, 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 I have written a few poems because mm. poetry and painting definitely go together. Mm. It's the one mm. literary form that does um, mm. knit up with the visual, mm. you know. Mm. Mm. Can I ask a very personal question? You are in Ireland, we're in Ireland, you're Irish, and... You know, I feel that you have a very, uh, a very, on a very truthful relationship living on. Do you have you ever thought about how you might express your spirituality? Obviously, you're not going to do it in a narrative way. You're not going to start painting narrative Christian scenes. I just don't see you doing that. But do you think there's any way in which your spirituality, which really is very deep, is expressed in your work? It's a difficult question, and you may not want to answer that. Well, I, I don't think there's any difference, really. I think um, you have to be a decent human being uh, at any rate, I think. Yes, but how is it expressed? Huh? Well, I think... Um, well, I like the idea... You mean the aesthetic element? No, not that, does Well, it? I like the aesthetic element in the religious... Uh, in buildings, churches. Yes, yes. I like the lovely music, like, I mean, Bach yes, and yes. Mozart. I mean, the Mozart's Requiem. Yes. How, how better is that? No, exactly. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, uh, I like the aesthetics of the, and the trappings of the church. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but you have no desire to somehow transmit that in paint? Well, I, I think it shouldn't really matter. I think you should be able to see the beauty. It's all about beauty at the end of mm. it. You know, beauty, love, God, whichever abstract word you put on it, it's all the same. Yes. It's all the same, and if you you treat everything of equal value, you treat your animals and your people, well, of course, your children, your family, yeah. your, you have to treat people as you would like to be treated. Yes, that's the very ancient principle. Yes. Pre-Christian, yeah. actually. Well, but yes, you're quite right. So, that, so, that, so really and truly, it's the way you live. It's just an everyday way of living. But I don't you? think you can turn, you can't, you have, you can't, Make say one thing into another. You have to, mm. you have mm. to put your money where your mouth is. You have mm. to go. Mm. You have to do what just do as you do. Well, Saint Teresa of Avila used to say, "Do as I say, not as I do." Yes. Yes. You know, but because she didn't think she was such a good person, you know. 
I was just thinking about um, Henri Bergson, the French philosopher. He was, um, there are a lot of halves in his life because he's half, half Polish, half Irish, and half Jewish. Actually, he's fully Jewish. He's Jewish, Irish, Polish, French. And he received the Légion d'honneur in 1904. He was very big at the turn of the century. And he, co- he coincided conveniently with a desire which had been building through the 19th century to reject Western culture and Western, including the church, so including everything to do with the pillars of Western culture, which included the church and Christianity, to find a new way. And part of that was the tremendous attraction of the Far East. So you had Japan, you know, the Japonism and the Yarling Society in Paris, and you had all the Impressionists collecting Japanese prints, and anything at all, and of course Monet doing his water lilies, which were based on uh, Japanese gardens, anything that was not going to take you back to, uh, to the Christian, Western, uh, Greek foundation of, of Europe. And of course, Gauguin actually said civilization was a disease, so he opened up this whole thing that anything that wasn't Christian, Western, or of Greek origin, it was bad. Now, along comes Bergson, who is this very small, wonderful sense of person, and he's Jewish, and he finds a way which navigates around all of this, and he particularly focuses on the idea of time. And so he says that there is no such thing as time. Time is not divided. You don't have years, months, weeks, hours. What you have is a continuous flow all the time. The time, as our concept, is completely Western and totally artificial, and there is a flow which never ends. And that is how Monet's work is interpreted, that the light passes across the water lily, he makes one canvas, another canvas. He's basically showing light passing, the day coming and the day going, and time never ends. He also said that in all things there was an élan vital, a vital spirit, which was his non-Christian way of saying what we would call the Holy Spirit of God. There's something divine in everything. Yeah? So you have a divine spirit, you have time that flows, is not broken up, and this comes in in 1904, one year before Einstein published his theory of relativity, which said that time was stretchy, so you can't measure anything because time is stretchy. Light bends because, uh, because, because of gravitational forces, so shadows don't tell you the truth, and that destabilized the visual arts very much. But you see, the idea that Henri Bergson came up with the philosophy was exactly right for the time, and gave you a way of being connected to a spiritual reality, but not through the Christian framework. Yes. I'm so I'm only saying that's kind of ties in with what you're saying. Uh, it's yes. about the everyday, real, ordinary flow of time yes. in ordinary life. That's where you find yes. your spiritual truth. If I, you mean, like. I mean, of course, that. time has been invented by time. Uh, time has been invented to, to, yeah, to yeah. create this sort of framework. Of, of, uh, yes, yes, a structure. So that we can communicate with yes. each other. And we can survive. Yeah, yes. yeah, so that we can survive. So yes. I don't have a problem with that. But I think, I think because when I look at your work, first of all, there are two forms of time. There's the time in the work, in the story, of, in the content, but there's also the time in the speed with which the painting made. And I have a tremendous sense of urgency that I've got to, you've got to get this paint down, you've got to do this now. It's almost a breathless urgency. I mean, it's in your life, it's in everything. This sense of urgency. Um, almost to the point of panic sometimes, that everything has to be done very quickly in the painting. That has affected your technique a lot, because it's very simplified and very quick. But I wondered whether you wanted to say anything about that, whether there is an anxiety there, which we don't see as as viewers, but which is actually there behind me. It's a bit personal, so if you don't want to... It's not personal at all. I I think... um, if you're sensitive, you can't stop being sensitive. No, you're sensitive yeah, yeah. all the time. Yes. So um, you cannot not be sensitive when you're sensitive. There's no rest from it. Yes. And no of rest. course, uh, anxiety is part of being sensitive. human. Yeah, being sensitive. And in a way, um, you, I, 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 I was always anxious as a child. I never slept as a child. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, um, it informs your whole day, it informs your life, you know. Um, anxiety is part of life, but we have to take it, mm. we accept it. It may also explain why there is so much yellow yes. in your artwork. Yes. Which, I mean, I find that it's touching, you know, I look at your painting and I want to hug you because I want to say it's okay. 
You don't need to be so rushed and stressed. It's all perfect. But if you weren't like that, it wouldn't be Elizabeth Cope's artwork. So well, they say you have to be yourself. You know, they say yellow was a form of sign of madness. So I, don't, I, I, don't don't know. I think it probably has different kinds of different kinds of connotations, like everything else, really. Um, but if you look at the compositions, the the lines that give a painting stability, or rather tranquility, are always horizontals. Yes. I don't see very many horizontals. In fact, I don't see any. Well, there's some at the back there. Yes. Um, I, I don't. Uh, horizontals give the painting tranquility. Yes. And verticals give the painting stability. Yes. Because if you imagine a vert- vertical beginning to yes. sway, yes. you feel unstable. Correct. And if you get a painting which is all diagonals, yes. you get extreme instability and aggression. Yes. And if you were to, if you this was a quiz, and I was saying, give me the painting with the most diagonals, it would probably be Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, yes. which is all sharp diagonal, as if he's attacked the canvas with a machete yes. and slashed it. Correct. Of course, he's 25, he's very anxious, he's taking a lot of drugs and, and everything else. But um, So the horizontals and the verticals give the pain stability, and I don't see very many of them in the painting. So there's a sort of floating sense in quite a lot, of, like here. You know, the fact that the, that the tonal qualities are the same at the back as in the front give the whole thing kind of floating quality. You'll well, see it in this one as well. I mean, I'm, I'm just... Yes. So it's a good point. Sometimes if you listen to powerful music, or my aunt used yes. to go out and sit on the diamond rocks in County Clare, mm. and when the sea was rough, Ooh. and it used to calm her down. So yeah, the rough, instead of a calm sea, the calm sea could fill you with turmoil, and the rough sea makes you calm. You know, if you... I, I think that's fascinating. I think we like to do the opposite for yes, It's all yes. to do with... Um, yes. If you're in a room and somebody is loud, you want to be quiet. Yes, you do. And if it's, it's the reverse, that's very true. If somebody is yeah. massive, you want to be more loud. So these paintings... Well, really balancing the yeah, books, really. so, balancing the book. so these paintings, yeah. where there is such a sense of chaotic energy, yes. is exactly back to Van Gogh. The yes. lightning conductive light discharging all Correct. Of it, so that you can come back to a point of calm yes. Yes. within yourself, having discharged yes. discharged all of that. No, it's quite it's quite true about... I mean, the, uh, uh, I, I, Wait, I'd be calm when I'm dead, you know. <laughs> be not kidding. Don't even I think, think about that. I don't even think so, about that. So, I mean, um, you, could, you could exaggerate anything, you know. But when people try and do something to make a quiet peace, it doesn't happen like that. Once yeah, you start yeah, forcing yeah. something, it's not going to work. In fact, some of the most um, most anxious people have produced the comments, uh, have produced the works with the most horizontal. Yes. And I'm thinking of Emil Nolder's. Oh, yes. Uh, Emil Nolder's. Northern landscapes, which are on the northern coast of, of of Prussia, I think. Yes. Which are very, they're very horizontal. Yes. But they're very tumultuous as well. Yes. So it's quite. Do you, do you ever sort of? I, I think it's a bit a bit impertinent and a bit rude, maybe. But think about your ancestry in terms of painters, because you know one could look at your work and it's quite it might not be too difficult to see where the where your ancestors are, your ancestry, you know whether it's in Expressionism or in, in Impressionism, uh, whether it is in um, early 19th century or late, whatever. And it's quite, do you ever do that? Or do you, do, or you don't? Well, I, I, I don't go out of my way I mean, to... But, but do you recognise it at all? You yes, know, I do recognise Matisse in your portrait, yes. Viard or Barnard yes. in your interiors, yes. and so on like that. And Edvard um, uh, Munch a little Monk bit. Munch a little bit. Now, is it true that you actually worked in his studio? I did, for two months. Oh, lovely. When was that? And... I think ten, mm. uh, but uh, I was quite uh, amused, if not slightly horrified, to think that he was copying his own paintings. Yeah, which he did a couple of times. For example, the sick child. Yeah, I don't think he had really a great time. He was, he went through a very small phase of producing a few things, and yeah. after that. So may I ask you a little bit historically that you have been all over the world. You have exhibited in uh, Texas, New York, I think Chicago. Um, certainly in London, uh, in France, and all over the world. But you've also had quite a number of residencies. Would you like to tell me a little bit about some of the residencies you've had? Well, uh, I, 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 I've had a residency more recently in Iran, where I visited when I was 20, in 1972. And um, that was very good. And then I had one in Brazil. Few years ago, yeah, that was a good time. And, um, but and New York, didn't you go to New York? I did. I two years in the National Arts Club in New York, in Amherst Park. And you lived in Brooklyn. Uh, yes, I went to a residency in Brooklyn, 
it's a, it's it's a good place. It's a good thing to do. If, if, you know, it gets you around, and uh, it, 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 we have a residency here, mm-hmm. so it gives me more insight in how we should treat artists when we actually come. Don't I feel that you have rather a special longing to be in North Africa, Morocco, and uh, Ethiopia, and places like that? I think something about the colour. Yes, uh, I suppose because we have a very green country with rain, the Mm -hmm. idea of desert is very appealing. I've been to Somalia twice, with Turkera, and Central America, Guatemala, and um, El Salvador, Honduras, a couple of times. And Ethiopia? Well, uh, I walked into Ethiopia from Somalia. I I wasn't actually there for... Not legally. (laughs) Well, probably not legally. (laughs) It's interesting that you talk about the desert because the one thing that doesn't come to mind looking at your work is desert and that a lot of people say that the desert is the place of discovery because it's calm, it's empty and you have this incredible, you know, lovely dark navy blue skies and stars and it's peaceful, it's freezing cold and many people have written about the desert as the place of discovery, it's where you find yourself and it's really interesting that you talk about Africa, but it's not in your work at all. So that could be a phase that's waiting for Well, you. I haven't been to Africa for many years now. Right, but it could I've be a phase. North Africa. I think it'd be wonderful to see how you do landscapes I would like that of the desert. Much. That would yeah. be particularly yeah. large scale. That would yeah. be absolutely marvelous. Well, I, we went to Australia in 2005 yes. and to the desert. Oh, you did? But I'd love to go to the very centre of Australia. Uh, where, it's, where, it's, yeah. minor, where it's 50 degrees centigrade. Oh. The most heat I've been in was in Somalia, 47 degrees, which is very hot. That's killing, yeah. So then travelling is really very important, but you keep on going back. I think it's important. You've been in Shankill for many, many years, and before that at another wonderful farm nearby, and so much of your work is effectively a visual diary, a record of the people that visit, the furniture you have, your children, toys, bits and pieces like the famous or infamous rubber um, lobster. <laughs> the rubber lobster that yes. features in a, a lot of your yes. uh, quite racy paintings. Well, Sybil uh, uh, bought that. Uh, uh, it was uh, one of those lobsters that were all the go, you know, the singing fish craze. Uh, I don't and I'd, I'd come back from somewhere and she said, I was surprised you so there was this lobster on a big plate with lettuce leaves all around. <laughs> you and she pressed the button and the lobster started singing this terrible country and <laughs> so ever since because the lobster was made of um, rubber which is Why a natural material important? because it's a natural material Why is that important because it's a natural material uh-huh, I see and I that's see. why I was taken by the lobster I still paint him he's still around I understand, his you, I understand you recently sold getting, you recently sold one of your most outrageous paintings um, which you sold from the exhibition in Crawford, in the Crawford Gallery in Cork. Uh, that exhibition was called The Nude in Irish Art, which of course is a complete oxymoron um, because there aren't hardly any nudes in Irish art. And the ones on the exhibition, your paintings, really, the only paintings really had real, very few really had nudes. But that painting, which shows, as far as I know, a, a naked girl being only raped by a lobster was quite racy and when it was being filmed by Carlo TV and you were being interviewed if I may remind you about this the interviewer said well Elizabeth Cope we now are talking this beautiful painting absolutely beautiful but the cameraman would not step back so that you could actually see the painting he was concentrating on the knees and hands and the face and they were not stepping back so you could actually see what was so beautiful so wonderful and he was saying yes well that was my Bumped it in fanny face. <laughs> Luckily, I'm over it now. <laughs> and you've sold the painting, which is absolutely well, the funny thing. The funny thing about that painting was I didn't really set out to shock anybody, uh, as you suggest. Uh, well, that's what it looks like. Uh, I, I feel like, like George O'Keefe, who, well, in her paintings close up, they all look like female well, genitalia. They're not nearly as explicit as no, yours. But I didn't go out of my way to make it. <laughs> I think uh, you did, actually. I didn't actually. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't. It looked quite like it. Honestly, I didn't. Anyway, it was a very good, honest phase, and you got through it. Yes, I'm glad I'm uh, over it now. And you've had some famous exhibitions because of them. Well, I, I have yet to exhibit. The one in Liverpool? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a group show, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a group show. So, but I have to keep um, on uh, trying to see what I can do to uh, 
do more stuff. You're more than to just keep doing things. May I, may I, I don't know whether we're probably, we've probably exhausted you, but if we could just wind up with one final question, which is the fact that you have recently published a very good book, which is just Elizabeth Cope, which I understand has been very successful. Uh, the title of the book is Seduced by the Smell of Paint, and it was uh, published by uh, Gandon Editions. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hilary. Thank you.